Hello, and welcome to the SAR core curriculum series. Um, I'm Kate Maturin, and I am happy to speak with you today about uterine malignancies, fundamentals, and what you need to know. I'd like to disclose royalties for educational publishing from Elsevier and Walters Kluwer and put in a little plug for our book on GU radiology, and I have a number of nice images of uterine and cervical cancer in this book, so I invite you to check it out. My objectives today are that at the conclusion of the talk, learners will understand basic subtypes and demographics of uterine malignancy, including endometrial carcinoma, which is by far the most common among these, cervical carcinoma, which is relatively less common, and uterine sarcoma, which is rare, and I'll spend time on them according to their prevalence. Learners will be familiar with the role of imaging for staging and treatment planning, and finally recognize important patterns of disease spread and recurrence. So let's first talk about endometrial cancer. Looking at incidence in overall sites of new cancer cases in men and women, we see that uterine cancer, or endometrial carcinoma, is actually fourth among cancers in women. You can see that it's a lot more common than renal cancer, pancreatic cancer, lymphoma, a whole bunch of entities that we spend a lot of time teaching and learning about in residency. So I think it's incumbent on us as radiologists to understand something about this disease. As I said, it's common, and it's particularly common in the United States. However, it's an often very survivable cancer. It's only the sixth leading cause of cancer death in U.S. women. There will be more than 60,000 new cases this year. The incidence in this country and in all westernized countries is steadily increasing, and that's because this disease is related to obesity, and our population increasingly is aging and it's inactive. 70% of cases of endometrial cancer are related to obesity, and that's because obesity increases peripheral production of estrogen through aromatization of testosterone precursors like androstenedione. Estrogens then increase the mitotic rate of endometrial cells and are primarily implicated as a risk factor in type 1 cancers. Um, endometrial cancer is usually in postmenopausal women and is almost always heralded by vaginal bleeding. Yet, major racial disparities persist in disease stage and survival, and we see that five-year survival is very high for white women and uh, considerably lower for black women. So we have a lot of work to do in this disease, and radiologists can help with this work in order to improve early treatment, diagnosis, and appropriate staging. So let's talk about those endometrial cancer subtypes. Generally speaking, we talk about endometrial cancer as being type 1 and type 2 cancers. Type 1 cancers are by far the more common type. So 85% of endometrial cancer is this so-called type 1 subset. The primary risk factor for these, as I said, is unopposed estrogen, usually related to obesity, sometimes related to hormone replacement therapy. And the histologic subtype in type 1 cancer is endometrioid. That's opposed to type 2 cancers that may have other histologies, and particularly I want to draw your attention to serous carcinoma and clear cell carcinoma, which are some bad actors among the type 2 cancers. Tumor grade, which is the FIGO grade 1, 2, 3, etc., which is uh, something that we assess under the microscope after the tumor is out, is generally low in type 1 cancer. So these are endometrioid FIGO 1 cancers, which are low grade and low stage at presentation, and as such, they have a very high five-year survival. A lot of times we don't even get a chance to see these cancers because they are detected because of vaginal bleeding, diagnosed by pipel biopsy in the clinic, and then treated with hysterectomy without any imaging. However, often the type 2 cancers are evaluated with imaging prior to surgery, and that's because these women have a much higher risk of advanced disease at presentation. So to summarize this distinction, key points. Most type 1 cancers are endometrioid. Most are low stage and low grade, and negative prognostic features usually associated with type 2 cancers include high grade, histology, non-endometrioid histology, such as serous carcinoma, deep myometrial invasion, and lymphovascular space invasion. And we'll look at a few more of these details uh, when it comes to the imaging of this entity. So what's the standard workup for postmenopausal bleeding? As you know, many of these women go to transvaginal ultrasound. If that ultrasound is negative or normal, patient goes on to clinical surveillance. Maybe the bleeding will stop on its own. If it's positive, meaning that there's an abnormal appearance of the endometrial stripe, which we'll talk about in more detail in just a second, patient will go on to office endometrial biopsy. Sometimes clinicians elect to go directly from the bleeding symptoms to endometrial biopsy without that intervening step of the ultrasound. 
The endometrial biopsy is performed in the office with these flexible pipel suction curettes. And this is a very low risk procedure. It doesn't require dilation. Uh, it's rarely associated with bleeding, pain, or uterine perforation. And so this is uh, a really simple and accurate way to get a diagnosis in the office of endometrial carcinoma, hyperplasia, or anything else that might be going on. If it's positive, the patient goes on to treatment. If it's negative, the patient might go on to further evaluation with dilation and curatage, a sonohistogram, or even hysteroscopy. Sometimes if an ultrasound wasn't previously performed, it'll be done here. Now, of course, patients would have liked to avoid dilation and curatage when they don't need it because it's a lot more invasive procedure, and for some reason they don't like the look of this equipment quite as much. Let's talk about the endometrial stripe itself. So all the published standards that you'll see and all the thresholds that we talk about are transvaginal, not transabdominal ultrasound. The measurement needs to be made orthogonal to the endometrial canal on a midline sagittal image, as in this case. So we're not talking about an oblique like this or like this. The measurement should not include the fluid in the canal if present. So in this case, the technologist placed calipers just on the tissue on the either side of the fluid. Finally, if you can't see the canal, don't measure it. And here's an example of an obscured endometrial stripe. Um, this CNA is going to show you basically a globular uterus with no distinguishable features. And you can imagine in this case that you might take the approach of saying, well, I can't see it and go on. But the reason that you can't see it is because it's markedly abnormal, because there's actually an advanced cervical cancer here and a bunch of fluid and debris inside the endometrial canal. So sometimes it can be very, very abnormal and not show on ultrasound. So if you can't see it, don't measure it. What about if you can see it? How thick is too thick? Now, in premenopausal women, the endometrial stripe will vary with their cycle, and we usually say something like 16 millimeters for a threshold here. I'd say this is not hard and fast. I would accept maybe even up to 2 centimeters or beyond in a premenopausal woman who's not having any abnormal bleeding. This trilaminar stripe that you're seeing here is completely normal in the secretory phase, and that's when endometrial stripe thickness is the greatest. In postmenopausal women with no bleeding, we usually use a threshold of less than 8 millimeters. Now, in postmenopausal women, the endometrium starts to look a lot less distinctive. It's thin, it's relatively similar in echogenicity to the myometrium, and um, it is assessed based on the context of bleeding or no bleeding. So, in women who aren't bleeding, we usually use a threshold of 8 millimeters as being normal. In women who are bleeding and who are postmenopausal, we use that 5 millimeter threshold. That cut point gives us uh, about 96% sensitivity for detection of endometrial pathology. And that's considered to be a pretty effective way of catching the cancers without overtreating other women. Now, of course, the risks of in-office pipel biopsy, as I alluded to, are super low. So maybe it's better to drive that sensitivity even higher. And many investigators have toyed with other thresholds like four millimeters, even as low as three millimeters. The problem is there's a huge amount of overlap between women who have um, cancer in women who actually have normal endometrial tissue at biopsy in terms of the thickness. And so even by driving that threshold down to three millimeters, we still only, we have um, increased sensitivity of 98%, but we drive down our specificity to 35%. So you can decide how you want to practice and your GYNs will do the same. But generally speaking, that five millimeter threshold is the number to remember for a postmenopausal woman with abnormal bleeding. So there's a number of morphologic signs that we can also use to detect an abnormal endometrium. So beyond just the thickness itself, here we've got a thickened endometrium at 2.4 cm, and it has this bubbly appearance. This bubbly appearance is pretty characteristic of complex atypical hyperplasia. I couldn't have told you based on this that it wasn't a low-grade carcinoma, and so it needs to be biopsied in any case. Complex atypical hyperplasia is kind of the last stop on the train to cancer town. So you are almost into a low-grade cancer at the stage of complex atypical hyperplasia. Now, in some women, that process can be reversed, as in this patient who has a history of tamoxifen therapy. As such, she's undergoing continuous estrogen stimulation to her endometrium. Now, remember that tamoxifen is a selective estrogen receptor modulator. So despite the fact that it has anti-estrogen effects in breast, the effects on the endometrium, bone, and heart are pro-estrogenic. As such, these women have a doubled rate of polyps and hyperplasia compared to the general population and an increased risk of carcinoma to about six to eightfold of the general population. The good news is most of their cancers are type 1 and low grade if they develop into cancer. Now, here's a patient who had a markedly thickened endometrium at 2.1 cm. The drug was withdrawn, and six months later, 
those changes had started to regress and the thickness is now down to 1.4 cm. And then a year later, she's down to less than a centimeter. So this shows you that the proestrogenic effects on the endometrium will regress over time if the stimulus is removed. Here's an example of a morphology which should be worrisome, particularly in a postmenopausal woman. Now, we've all seen subendometrial leiomyomas protrude into the canal and create some weird appearances. But remember, those tend to be hypoechoic because their echogenicity follows that of the myometrium. In endometrial origin lesions, such as polyps, or in this case carcinoma, the echogenicity follows that of the endometrium. So a hyperechoic mass usually comes from the endometrium, not the myometrium. And in an older woman, this is highly likely to be a carcinoma. In this case, it was an endometrioid carcinoma, and it was a FIGO grade 2. This is an example of another morphology that we should be concerned about when we see it. So this is a papillary mass, which actually has a really complex surface. Imagine like cauliflower or broccoli or something like that. And the ultrasound beam is actually not able to resolve how tiny these little papillations are on the surface of this mass. And so it may just look like it has a hyperechoic edge to it. Here's what it looks like in another um, obliquity. And finally, we can see here that it has substantial vascularity. So this papillary morphology is characteristic of serous carcinomas. And that's true in the uterus. It's also true in the ovary. Whenever we see that frond-like morphology, it's very characteristic of serous tumors. And remember, serous tumors are those type 2 tumors, which are more likely to be high stage at presentation. They're more likely to have myometrial invasion, lymphovascular space invasion, and positive nodes. This is another example of a morphology which should be concerning, um, which is a finding of hematometros, particularly in the setting of irregular soft tissue lining the endometrial canal. So here we see a patient who has both areas of soft tissue studding the canal, as well as kind of a stalactite of blood here hanging down into a pool of hemorrhagic material layering dependently within the endometrial canal. And we were able to demonstrate some vascularity within some of this tissue. And this was actually a multifocal high-grade serous carcinoma with deep myelinvasion, lymphovascular space invasion, and positive nodes. So again, that serous carcinoma type is a type 2 cancer, and those are the ones that can really be more aggressive. Another morphology to think about is the loss of margins. And so in this case, the technologist wasn't quite sure where to measure and was able to find some measurements here which added up to something that was normal, so, you know, about 4 millimeters. However, the tumor is actually the part up here where we can't really see the area of the margins. And so you should always be suspicious of places where you lose the ability to distinguish between structures or tissue types. Here we see an area of vascularity corresponding to that. And this was an endometrioid carcinoma, which was a FIGO grade 3 and had some deep myometrial invasion. So loss of margination of structures is something I really want you to think about. Here's a more exaggerated example of loss of margins with a patient who has an echogenic mass replacing most of the central uterus and growing deeply into the myometrium, so much so that we completely lose uh, some of the normal anatomic structures here on this transverse image. And on CT, on a sagittal image, we can see why. This was a tumor that arose in the endometrial canal and deeply invaded the posterior myometrium and it actually grew directly through it, so transserosal extension into adjacent soft tissues. And this was an endometrial carcinosarcoma, which is kind of a hybrid tumor type. It used to be called triple MT, a malignant mixed mullerian tumor, but it has components of epithelial neoplasm, so carcinoma, and mesenchymal neoplasm, or sarcoma, in the same lesion. All of these endometrial types have uh, similar patterns of spread when they become advanced. So we're going to see pelvic and paraaortic lymph nodes, local invasion, and um, this tissue is going to be extremely avid on FDG PET CT. CT and PET can be used to look for distant disease, but they are not usually as helpful to look for T-staging. T-staging, we really rely on MRI. The role of MRI for evaluation of uterine neoplasms is evolving, and it's largely reserved for aggressive histologies in most centers in the United States. However, if you look at some other countries in Europe, you'll find that MRI is used a lot more commonly, and I think we're headed more and more that direction. And that's because it has a very unique ability to establish the depth of invasion preoperatively that helps with risk stratification, and it helps with determining the strategy for dealing with nodes in the operating room. When we report these cases, we need to report the uterine size because this is a surgical disease. And we 
are able to help our gynecologic oncology colleagues if we can give them a sense of what they'll be dealing with when they get to the operating room. We always look for the myometrial depth of invasion, and that's because the distinction between T1A and T1B is important. Most women with T1A cancers will go on to simply be surveilled after their hysterectomy and they don't need any adjuvant therapy, but women with T1B disease, meaning more than 50% invasion, uh, may need adjuvant therapy, often including pelvic radiation to prevent vaginal cuff recurrence. Now, in life and on the boards, I think it's not as important to understand exactly what constitutes T1, T2, T3, T4 for each tumor type as it is to understand the concepts behind it. So in uterine cancer, myometrial invasion is a fundamental question. If it's deeply invasive of the myometrium, it's T1B. And if it involves the cervix, that's kind of the concept um, in other organs of deep involvement of that organ itself. That's T2. If it goes out of the organ, it's T3. And if it goes into adjacent structures, it's T4. We should always look for suspicious nodes on MRI. And we look in the pelvic side walls and we look at paraaortic nodes. And nodes are suspicious when they're enlarged, when they're clustered, when they're necrotic, or when they have similar signal characteristic to the primary tumor. Now, as I alluded to, the nodal surgery approach varies with different institutions. And so we know that doing an extensive lymph node dissection will predispose women to having more problems um, with lymphatic backup and potentially with limb swelling, potentially it increases the operative time. And so we don't want to subject women to having more nodes removed than they need, but women who have high-risk histologies or high-risk morphologies at imaging should probably have a node dissection or a sentinel node approach at least um, because they have a higher risk of having node-positive disease. So the key MRI sequences for endometrial cancer evaluation, and this is going to look similar to what we talk about for adnexal masses, what we talk about for cervix, what we talk about in prostate. The key sequences are multiplanar T2, diffusion, and a dynamic or multiphasic post-contrast acquisition. Now on T2-weighted imaging, endometrial tumors are brighter than myometrium and darker than the normal endometrium. So here we see a little strip of normal endometrium in the middle on this axial image, and we see tumor out on both lateral margins, which is an intermediate gray that some people call evil gray. And so that's what sort of signal characteristics these masses will have on T2-weighted imaging. You can see in this case, the patient also has a pelvic sidewall node seen over here on the right and a left ovarian metastasis or synchronous tumor. We often find endometrioid carcinomas in the ovary and the endometrium at the same time, and that's either because of metastasis from one to the other or um, sometimes synchronous evolution. And it's important to remember that women with endometrial cancer who are young may have a tumor syndrome such as Lynch syndrome that also will predispose them to ovarian cancer. So we always have to look at the ovaries when we're doing MRI for the endometrium. Let's move now to diffusion-weighted imaging, where we see that the tumor is brighter than normal endometrium, and it always retains its hyperintensity as we increase the B value. So as we go to the highest B value, fluid signal will null out, but tumor signal will continue to rise or to be hyperintense to adjacent parenchyma. So we see very high signal in the tumor on diffusion-weighted imaging. I want to point out that the normal endometrium also has relatively high signal on diffusion-weighted imaging. That's just something to know in life but that tumors actually have even more hyperintense signal than endometrium itself. Endometrium is pretty cellular, and that's why it has relatively high signal, but tumor is even brighter on a high B-value uh, DWI. Post-contrast imaging, we have somewhat variable enhancement in the arterial and portal venous phases, but if we go out to a two or three minute delayed phase, as in this case, that's when we're going to see a maximal contrast between the tumor, which tends to be hypo-enhancing, and the myometrium. And that's where we get some of our best assessment for depth of invasion, as in this case where we see deep myoinvasion posteriorly. And this was a grade 1 endometrioid carcinoma with metastases to the left ovary and nodes um, with just about 50% myometrial invasion there. By contrast, here's a tiny little T1A carcinoma, and it's up here in the uterine fundus. It's a little hard to make out on the sagittal imaging, it becomes more clear, at least to me, on this uh, axial image where we can see that intermediate or evil gray signal up in the right fundus. We can see a preserved junctional zone all around it, so that's a sign that we probably don't have deep myometrial invasion. If we weren't confident that that was the tumor, here's where DWI is very helpful. So we see corresponding very high signal on diffusion-weighted imaging and low signal on the ADC map, confirming that this area of interest on the T2-weighted imaging really is the tumor.
And so this is an example of a non-myoinvasive endometrioid carcinoma. And again, there are several different roles for MRI in endometrial cancer, and it's a little bit beyond the scope of our talk to go into all of them, but the most important questions for you to assess are depth of invasion and nodal involvement. Sometimes when you're trying to learn how to stage a tumor that you haven't worked on much before, it's really helpful to have a dictation template. So I want to refer you to the uterine and ovarian cancer DFP webpage, where we actually have a template for both endometrial and cervical cancer. So using these kinds of templates, um, that's how I learned how to read rectal cancer and prostate cancer, for example. So if I know what sorts of questions the clinicians need answered, then I can train my brain to look at the right things. So I would recommend both of these templates to you. They were developed by the DFP. Finally, I want to mention a note about patterns of recurrence in endometrial carcinoma. So many people don't realize that up to 10% of patients with endometrial cancer will recur without adjuvant therapy, and 70% of those recurrences will be in the vaginal cuff. So it's incredibly important whenever you're looking at post-op imaging in a patient who's had endometrial cancer to look at the vaginal cuff. Now on CT, we can see this kind of irregular mass here, something interposed between the um, bladder and the rectum. Shouldn't be there. Sometimes it's easier to see that on a sagittal. I think it's pretty evident on the axial here. We can see it as that same evil gray on T2-weighted imaging, and we can see it here as well on a sagittal image. So this is really important to have in your brain as something to look for. It's a very common pattern of recurrence in endometrial carcinoma. So I'm going to transition now to cervical cancer, but um, I kind of like this comic. You're 57 years old. I'd like to get that down a bit. Just to remind us that the major risk factor for the aggressive endometrial cancers is aging. So there's not a lot we can do about that. There is something we can do about understanding the disease and improving early detection by imaging. And we can improve um, the level of activity and obesity in this country. But all of that is a lot harder than improving the risk factors for cervical cancer, which has a very clear target. So in cervical cancer, it's largely related to HPV, human papillomavirus. And in the United States and in many other industrialized countries, we've actually really gotten a handle on cervical cancer because of pap screening and of HPV vaccines. So the incidence and the mortality of this disease are declining in the United States. However, worldwide, it's still a huge cause of cancer death in women. And actually, 90% of the cervical cancer cases worldwide are in developing countries. 25% of them are in India alone. This disease has a 60 to 70% five-year survival in high-income countries. That's still not that great. And it's much worse in lesser developed countries and in areas of this country with lower socioeconomic status. So although um, endometrial cancer is usually symptomatic with vaginal bleeding, cervical cancer is usually asymptomatic at early stages. And that's why screening is so essential for early detection. So pap screening. We really don't have an image-based screening method for cervical cancer. Let's look briefly at the disease subtypes. The vast majority of cervical cancer is squamous carcinoma, and this is the HPV-related tumor. It arises from the ectocervix, or the outer portion of the cervix, and then grows upward and outward and anywhere that it wants with a very infiltrative pattern of spread. And you can see on this sagittal T2-weighted MRI a gray tumor centered in the cervix, which seems to just obscure margins of everything around it, and that's the growth pattern of squamous carcinoma. That's somewhat in contrast to adenocarcinoma, which is a little bit less common, and it actually arises from glands within the endocervix. So remember that um, adenocarcinomas often are arising from a different type, non-squamous type of epithelium. And in this case, endocervical carcinoma, they're arising from mucinous glands, and they actually may look like a GI tumor under the microscope. There are a few other subtypes like small cell and neuroendocrine type tumors of the cervix, um, which do not have very distinctive imaging features, but they do have slightly different histologic findings and implications for long-term treatment. Cervical cancer and ultrasound. So ultrasound is not a screening test for cervical cancer. It may be very hard to detect cervical cancer on ultrasound, but we sometimes do. And one of the ways we can do it is to look for hypervascularity. So here's an example of an older woman who had abnormal vaginal bleeding, and she was actually noted on this transvaginal image to have a hypoechoic mass. More striking, though, is the vascularity of this mass, and here's when it really jumps out at you. Now, I've seen a number of cervical cancers missed at ultrasound, but in retrospect, if you look back at the Doppler images, there's almost always hypervascularity in the area of that tumor. 
So I want to tell you about that pearl and that potential pitfall. So you'll think about that when you're looking at pelvic ultrasound. Although you're not doing it with the intention of detecting cervical cancer, you might detect it if you pay attention to Doppler. Here's another example of a very vascular cervical cancer at ultrasound. On this initial image on the left, everything's kind of commingled and it's very difficult to make out the anatomy. The central image shows a lot of hypervascularity in that tumor, and the MRI image shows why. There's a very extensive exophytic mask that's actually filling and expanding the fornices of the vagina, and it's getting in the way of the ultrasound probe, but it's extremely vascular. So let that vascularity be your guide that there's something strange going on here. What about CT and PET and cervical cancer? So they are extremely helpful to provide nodal and metastatic, so N and M staging, but not so much tumor staging. Again, just like endometrial cancer, we look for pelvic and paraaortic lymph nodes, as in this case, and we look for distant metastases, which in cervix tend to go to lungs, mediastinum, bone, and liver. We look for upstream effects of local disease, particularly hydronephrosis. So cervical cancer likes to involve the distal ureters, cause upstream obstruction of the kidneys, and even renal failure, which can be a cause of death in women with cervical cancer. Um, it gives a confers a higher stage disease if the ureters are involved, so that's something to always think about and remember to remark upon when we look at these CTs. The FIGO paradigm is something that's a little complicated and sometimes hard for us to understand as radiologists because it really doesn't incorporate imaging. For the first time, the FIGO paradigm for cervical cancer staging um, incorporated CT and PET in 2018. Prior to this, fundamentally, it was based on physical exam, plain films, and um, some other widely available imaging studies on a global basis. And that's the reason. It's supposed to be a method that can be used by anyone in any kind of medical context. But we know now that we can improve staging by using cross-sectional imaging. And so FIGO staging does incorporate that for the first time. For tumor staging or T-staging, we know that MRI is much more sensitive and accurate than physical examination. And there have been many studies in the literature documenting this. And so that's why we're starting to see greater incorporation of this approach in the United States and elsewhere. FIGO staging, again, is clinical, but reports can communicate the AJCC T stage. So in other words, I would not presume on an MRI to say what the FIGO stage was, but I will often say that an AJCC T stage would be such and such in order to communicate what I think. This um, chart at right incorporates both types of staging. The fundamental distinction is between surgery and primary chemoradiation. So women with small tumors may be treated either with conization, trachelectomy, removal of just the cervix, or with a radical hysterectomy. Women below the line who have parametrial or more extensive local tumor involvement will be treated with primary chemoradiation. So this is not neoadjuvant therapy. This is not the situation that we see, for example, in rectal cancer, where the intention is to shrink the tumor and then operate on it. Instead, in cervical cancer, the intention is to do the complete treatment with chemo and radiation. So this is a really important distinction, and imaging is very helpful in establishing where this threshold is. The key sequences for cervical cancer evaluation are just like the key sequences for endometrial cancer. Multiplanar T2-weighted imaging, especially with longitudinal and short-axis images through the cervix. I prefer to use non-fat sat T2-weighted imaging. You can see parametrial extension much better, as in this case. Diffusion-weighted imaging, where we're going to see that these tumors are extremely high signal, and then dynamic post-contrast imaging. And now again, I think that the tumor enhancement characteristics are somewhat variable. Usually tumors that have not been previously treated will be hypervascular, and usually they'll be somewhat less enhancing than the surrounding tissue on a delayed image, but it is somewhat variable. I do find that the delayed post-contrast sequences are very helpful to look for local invasion of other structures like rectum and bladder, but this is probably my least important sequence. Really, it's T2 and diffusion that are your worst workhorses here for cervical cancer. We love to look for assessment of parametrial invasion on those short axis T2 weighted imaging. So this is an oblique view. So here's a uterus that's relatively uh, retroflexed, and we can see sort of a strange obliquity to the cervix itself. Then if we look at this dotted line, that's what the second image is representing, the short axis through the tumor. So imagine that you're looking down the barrel of the tumor. Some people like to do the diffusion in the same plane. You can do it that way, or you can do axial diffusion as long as you're able to correlate the two. 
But you can see here a nice example of cervical stroma, which is preserved posteriorly, so that hypo-intense cervical stromal ring, which is that dark crescent, compared to anteriorly and on left lateral side of this tumor, where we see the tumor has invaded right through the stroma and is going into the parametrium. So this would, again, indicate that this is T2B disease, and the patient would go on to actually have primary chemoradiation rather than surgery. It's also important to describe the depth of extension of tumor outside of the serosal surface of the uterus, and that's because radiation planning may hinge on this, and the size of the tumor in general is an important distinction in staging. Again, take a look at those SARDFP templates. I think they're helpful for structuring your reports. Here's one more example of parametrial invasion, and this is actually an adenocarcinoma. This is a very large cervical mass with transmural involvement. Has it gone all the way beyond the serosa? Let's take a look. So here we can see on the right side with the black arrow that there's some preserved cervical stroma and that there's probably not T2B disease on that side, but on the left side that that evil gray is extending way laterally into the parametrium, and so this is clearly beyond the confines and would be primary chemoradiation. Finally, here's an example of bladder invasion, or two examples actually, and there's a distinction that's made between so-called bolus edema, which is what we see a blistering look on the inside of the urinary bladder when the tumor has simply invaded the submucosal space of the bladder versus transmural invasion when it actually has tumor that's enhancing that's growing all the way through the bladder wall. And that's something that you could see with cystoscopy. You'd actually see tumor there and be able to biopsy it. So those have two different staging implications. So these are some nuances that you could get into if you're interested in this topic, but just to be aware that there is a distinction between superficial and deep invasion of adjacent organs. Finally, I want to show you one patient who has more of a mucinous type endocervical cancer. Again, we've all seen nebothian cysts in the cervix, and those are those mucinous glands which become obstructed and actually become quite enlarged in some cases, and they can be tough to distinguish from mucinous endocervical cancer. But I would again look for soft tissue that enhances, and I would look for intermediate or gray signal rather than pure fluid signal that you might see um, in something that's just mucinous. We can see a tumor here which has kind of a polypoid appearance, but it's actually just multiple locules of mucin, and we can see that the whole thing was hyper-enhancing. I think we all hope that we won't have to deal with these things and we'll be able to go to the doctor and be told, you're the healthiest person I've ever seen. Don't even bother coming back. But I want to close with just a few slides about uterine sarcoma, which is a rare tumor. Usually this is going to be leiomyosarcoma. There are also endometrial stromal sarcomas and a few other subtypes, but leiomyosarc is the one to really be aware of. It's difficult to distinguish it from an atypical leiomyoma or fibroid. And since fibroids are so much more common and they often look very weird, um, it's a sometimes dangerous practice to go around trying to diagnose sarcomas. But I can tell you about a couple of features that I find helpful at MRI. One famous feature is rapid growth, but this is particularly important after menopause. Sometimes in about ages 45 to 50, as women approach menopause, we see benign fibroids grow kind of rapidly. So beware of that as a pitfall. Infiltrative margins are clearly a malignant marker, and uh, T2 dark spots are something that I've learned about recently. This is actually hemosiderin within the mass from repeated episodes of bleeding and blood products at varying ages. You can also see these with susceptibility-weighted sequences. Foci of very high signal on T1-weighted imaging pre-contrast can indicate hemorrhage. Of course, we can also sometimes see that in fibroids. And then areas of irregular non-enhancement are characteristic of sarcomas. But again, we can sometimes see these in fibroids. The more of these features you have together, the more likely you are to have a leiomyosarcoma. I'm going to show you one other leiomyosarcoma that's got a couple of the features. And this was a tumor that was born in the anterior fundus, but extruded posteriorly into the uterine canal or into the endometrial canal. And so this idea of transgressing boundaries and structures is something that a sarcoma very commonly does. It has some patchy areas of non-enhancement, and under the microscope, that corresponds to these very characteristic zones of coagulative necrosis that are typical of leiomyosarcomas and are different than the type of necrosis that we sometimes see in fibroids, where they simply outgrow their blood supply. So to conclude, endometrial cancer is common. It's related to obesity and unopposed estrogen exposure. It's usually low-grade and low-stage. 5 millimeters for the endometrial complex is the upper normal threshold for postmenopausal women with abnormal uterine bleeding. 
and MRI assessment focuses on myometrial invasion and lymph nodes. Cervical cancer is uncommon, particularly in the United States. It's decreasing in incidence, but it remains a big problem worldwide. It's hypervascular on ultrasound, but it's often missed on ultrasound. MRI assessment is focused on parametrial involvement, and the key distinction that we're making at imaging is T-staging to distinguish between primary chemoradiation for advanced tumors and surgery for less advanced tumors. Uterine sarcoma is rare. Leiomyosarcomas grow rapidly. They contain blood products of varying ages, and they invade adjacent structures. Endometrial stromal sarcomas are also rare. They look like an aggressive endometrial cancer, and we usually can't distinguish those by imaging. Finally, fortune favors the prepared mind, or some people say this, you see what you look for and you look for what you know. So you need to know about these diseases and be aware of them and their surgical considerations, the patterns of recurrence, so that you can recognize these things when they appear before you. A well-informed radiologist can really participate in treatment planning for these tumors and contribute meaningfully to patient care. Thank you very much for your attention today, and thank you to the SAR for inviting me to participate in this lecture series. Have a great day.